What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Team to Beat Miami Heat podcast. My name is Amir. I got my cousin joining us once again. We got Darion, a.k.a. Dime Dropper. What's going on, Darion? I'm good, man. I'm good. It's good to be uh, talking hoops again and just seeing you again. So, yeah. So, we have been talking for a while now, and I've been asking this man. This young man is extremely busy. He is now a coach for an AAU team, and so he doesn't have a lot of time after work. But I've been talking to him about doing a show, and so you see on my channel, obviously it's a Miami Heat channel, and I've been doing different shows with with Martel, the Miami Heat Chronicles, with Ernest, Dos Minutos. I wanted to do one with Dime. We know he's a Clippers fan. He's been on the show a couple times. So I want to do a show. Of course, we're always going to touch upon the Miami Heat, but this is going to be more about current events across the NBA. And I want to call it a dime, a cousin. So he's the dime. I'm the cousin. We're cousins. So that's the name of the show. We're going to talk about just the NBA landscape. But before we talk about NBA news, I want to talk to you real quick about the Miami Heat's offseason. We haven't talked in a long time, and there's been a lot of speculation um, around Jimmy Butler and his extension. He wanted this extension, and we shot it down. And he said, okay, that's fine. We could revisit revisit this. I thought when the Miami Heat said we're not going to offer Jimmy an extension, he was going to ask for a trade potentially, or the Miami Heat were going to be willing to trade him because they don't want him to walk away because the way players – get moved now as they demand trades or organizations trade these players during their final year, right? To get some assets before they leave, kind of like how the Jazz did with Donovan Mitchell a few years ago. And so this Miami Heat's offseason has been super quiet right now. And I mean, the only thing we've really done is added Alex Burks for a minimum and drafted Kalel Ware and added some undrafted guys. So what are your thoughts like an outlook on this Miami Heat like team next season like we're in a weird spot because we're we're in the final year of the jimmy build like we still have tyler hero we, we haven't been able to trade him jimmy bam and tyler haven't worked we added terry rozier he got hurt jimmy got hurt just w- what direction do you think this miami heat team should go in moving forward it, yeah it, it's an interesting conversation because you're clearly just not quite good enough to win the championship i think we've all seen that the heat can go deep into the playoffs make deep runs but you missed out on all these potential, not just free agents, but guys that have been wanting to get moved, whether it be Donovan Mitchell or Damian Lillard or James Harden or Kyrie Irving or whoever it may be that the Heat have been rumored with, you know, DeRozan even this summer I was hearing some stuff. And there's the whole Heat culture thing. And guys that Pat Riley and the Heat just don't really want to take a chance on. They feel as though they don't fit the mold of what they preach over it with the Heat organization. And I wonder if that's starting to get in their own way of taking a chance on guys because you need some help scoring the ball. I think that's the main thing. You just – your offense needs help, especially in the regular season. And I'm a big Jimmy Butler fan. Like, I really, you know, advocated for him and thought he was better than a lot of the great players in the NBA. But this past season – I was a little disappointed with his lack of care and and seemingly arrogant approach in the regular season. Like as long as we're in the playoffs, we're going to make a run. And then he gets hurt unnecessarily pump faking against the Sixers in the playing game. And then we don't even get a series against Boston. So I really don't know. I think that Jimmy Butler's approach in the regular season is not serious enough to win a championship anymore. I think the heat in general haven't been a good enough regular season team. I think in the playoffs, you've been great, but you constantly have to play four series on the road or whatever it may be, and that's not how championship teams win. If you look at every championship team ever outside of two, it's been a top three seeded team. So to me, how can the Heat improve their regular season process? For me, a lot of that is you need more offensive firepower. You do need another guy. I think Tyler Hero is, at to me, on a championship level, he's a sixth-man kind of guy. I don't think he's a great starting point guard. I think he's too much of a gunner, shoots a lot of jump shots. His passing is solid, but nothing crazy. And defensively, he's not very good. So to me, I think he, like, that's your your best offensive player outside of Jimmy Butler. And Bam is what? Tyler Hero. And I don't know. I also, Terry, Ro- Terry Rozier is in the mix too now, but he. Yes. And we didn't get to see him sadly last year. So I think a lot of the, you know, not doing stuff 
this summer is like, well, Terry Rozier is going to feel like a new player next season because you guys didn't really get to reap the full benefits of it, but you're still qu not quite there. And, you know, the Clippers are in a similar spot. Like I'm an, I'm an, I can relate to the whole, we're, we're pretty good, but we're not quite there. The thing is we don't really have draft picks. You know, we took the swing at James Harden, right. To help out Paul George and Kawhi Leonard, but we don't have the draft picks to re to restart right now. And, at least with you guys, you've seen Jimmy Butler play at a high level in the playoffs. Right? You have those because Jimmy Butler and Kawhi came at the same time. Jimmy Butler went to Miami that same summer Kawhi came to the Clippers. And you have some great memories of Jimmy Butler outside of the bubble, not just the bubble, in the playoffs. I can't say the same about Kawhi for me. So except for one series against Dallas in 2021. So, yeah, yeah it really just depends on like what the front office thinks. I saw a quote thinking that they feel like they're talented enough. But yeah. I disagree with that massively. I don't think you are talented enough. And if that's the case, then the godfather, my, my coaching idol, uh, Pat Riley, is uh, a little delusional right now. I mean, he's almost 80 years old. So, um, yeah, a lot of people are saying Pat's falling asleep at the wheel. Pat needs to retire. Pat hasn't um, acquired a whale, you know, free agent or whatever through trade since Shaquille O'Neal like they they the Heat fans in the comments say it's Dwayne Wade who orchestrated the you know LeBron James um s the sign and trade technically even though it was a free agent which that was a mistake um we had to we had to give up assets for that and there's a lot of mistakes the front office have made you know in different eras and they keep mentioning though Dwayne Wade brought Bosch and you know Dwayne Wade became friends with Jimmy and that's only that's the only reason why he came so it's like they're thinking Pat doesn't have all his faculties at this point, but I agree with a lot of the things you said too. Like going back to like the seating and the regular season, like, are you, are you secretly watching my, my uh, videos cousin, even though you're not a Miami heat fan? Like I try to tune in and support you as my, as your cousin, but I'm not a Clipper fan. So I can't be engaged with all your videos. Um, but I've been saying that recently and I've been trying to say that a lot that like, if you're not a top three team in the NBA, like you're not going to win like a seed, you're not going to win like 52 of the last 78 champions were the one seed. Like they win for a reason because being a good regular season team is a barometer for success in the playoffs. So I agree with that piece as well. And Jimmy coasts because his body's supposedly banged up from the, the, the Thibodeau years in Boston and all these long playoff runs and, and whatnot. And like, he hasn't had major serious like injuries like Clay or any of those types of players, you know, KD, but he misses 20 games and like he does that because he wants to save up for the playoffs. And it's like it's crazy and annoying because it makes it harder for the Miami Heat by being in a bad position, by being the seventh seed and then losing in the playoff play in game both years in a row. The first game, you know, that's there in the eighth seed both both years. Um, and it's not a formula for success, which. I'm tired of. Um, I lost my train of thought for a second. Yeah. Oh, no, I got it. Jesus Christ. So Jimmy was proving, though, that the formula can work again. And we saw that in the playing game, which was annoying that we were in, even in that position because of all the injuries and the availability because we could have won one extra game. We would have been out of the play in. But we played the Sixers and you saw Jimmy say, OK, I'm playoff Jimmy now. Playoff Jimmy. We saw that commercial. It's a thing. And it's so freaking annoying that he's not taking the regular season series because you saw what he did in that first quarter. You mentioned it. He did all those pup fakes to get the, the like the foul baiting crap. He in that first quarter had three steals alone. He had two interceptions. Like there was a play where he picked one of the Philly defenders, and then he, the another Philly defender actually got the loose ball, and then he stripped that guy. Like he was so locked in, and. He had like 13 points or something like in that first half, 14 points, like shooting efficiently. Like he was like, okay, it's time to play. And that shit's so frustrating because it's like, I want you to do that a few extra times in the regular season so we don't have to be a playing team. Like do this earlier so that you don't have to do that. And look what happened. You got hurt, right? So yeah, anyway, enough with the heat and all that. It's it's. I don't know what direction we're going to go in right now. We're kind of doing a blended build just like the the Warriors have been doing kind of with Kaminga and Moody and players like that and like having Steph and Draymond and Clay, 
we're doing that same thing now with Jaime Hawkins and Jovic and now adding Kalel Ware. And so like we're stuck in the middle, which is not fun. So, you know, you kind of know how that, that feels. Um, but let's talk a little bit more about some other teams. Like let's talk about the Clippers specifically, because there's, there's two moves that happened during this off season that affected your team. One was the Paul George team or Paul George, uh, trade. Um, and then also, um, your favorite player, Russell Westbrook, you know, today signed with the uh, the Denver Nuggets, or he's going to once he clears waivers for a buyout. But that Paul George move, it affects the Miami Heat now because the, the Miami Heat and the Sixers are kind of rivals. So that makes the East more tough. We got a really good player from the West now. So like the, the East is going to get more competitive. So, but just what are your thoughts just on losing Paul George? Like, did you expect this? Did you see that coming? And then after the follow up, is just thoughts on Russ. No, I did not see it coming. I didn't think that Paul was going to leave L.A. I really didn't. And I also didn't think the Clippers were going to be as okay with him leaving. You know, Paul George called the Clippers bluff. They were like, you really going to go to Philly? And he did. And I get it. It's a business, and he got a really great deal. But he's leaving L.A. He's leaving his family. He's leaving his home. And he wanted to be a Clipper. But fact of the matter is, Paul George – ducked responsibility his entire time in LA. It was always something he needed. It was always a friend that he wanted to sign. He wasn't getting the ball enough or he was handling the ball too much. It was just a lot of excuses time and time again. And he's very inconsistent for a star. So I would have never paid him what Philly did, but Philly did. They went all in to try to support Embiid. And the thing is, you just don't replace guys like Paul George. What sucks is we gave up everything for him with the SGA trade because Kawhi demanded another star. And now we let him walk away for nothing. So that's a disaster. But I think the Clippers are realizing that the only thing they can do after losing all their draft picks for the rest of the decade is get enough cap space in 2026 or 2027 to go for a new free agent with a new arena and start a new era of Clipper basketball because the draw of LA of having a, of an owner that wants to win in a new stadium that is going to be better of a better chance of getting becoming good again than you know the draft. We don't have picks, and like the Kawhi Leonard chip to me has sailed. Like you know, in terms of can we wish that this guy's healthy? I mean, is this guy going to be healthy? It's just to me, it's a waste of time. It's just there's nothing that we there's nothing that says we should believe he's going to stay healthy. He's incredible when he plays, but there's nothing to say that. So losing Paul George is tough. Because we're just un undoubtedly, to me, not going to be better this year. But I like the, the pickups we've made in terms of bolstering our defense since he left. Derek Jones Jr., Chris Dunn, uh, Batum coming back. That's awesome. Are those guys going to make us better? Oh, than he is? You, sorry, you, you got Nick Batum coming back? Yeah, how great is that? Fan favorite. We love him. He's going to come off the bench. It's great. Screw that. I hate Nick. Me and Heat Nation hate him. Philadelphia game. We freaking oh. that playing game. Nick, Nick Batum had like 28 points against us. Miami Heat. He is obviously a scrub only. I'm calling him only a scrub because of his age. We I categorize him as a Miami Heat scrub killer because there's always like a guy like that that will beat you. It's not Joel Embiid. It wasn't Maxi. It's that guy. Like there's always a guy that does that to us. Uh, he's obviously not a scrub, but I he cooked us in that playing game. But also just obviously again heat podcast here Derek jones jr that was awesome yep. to see him get paid like he helped dallas go to an nba finals good three and d role player like what else can you ask for right i think that's a great pickup for you guys yeah right? and we lack athleticism so getting Derek jones is huge there and then as far as the westbrook thing i mean when we got hard in we kind of pushed westbrook aside like and i really didn't like that because to me i don't trust either of them at the biggest stage but i would rather go if i'm going down I like yeah. going down with Russell Westbrook because he's a, a fighter, plays hard, and he just kind of gave us something that we didn't have, which was a vocal leader, downhill rim pressure, an athlete, a pace pusher. We didn't have that. Harden, I think he just made us a better offensive team and gave us a ball handler, pick and roll god, but he made us more old and slow. And you know I can't stand watching James Harden play basketball. He just, to me, over dribbles. He doesn't uh, – he, 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 he hinders ball movement for me unless he's just – directly creating advantages in the pick and roll himself. If he does not have his game going, it really hinders your team because then you end up giving him so you give him whatever team James Harden goes to, he handles the ball the most. Whichever yeah. team he goes to. So, you're you're putting a lot into him and when his offense isn't going, 
which most nights he'll still create some good shots for you, but if his offense isn't going, he's taking away from other guys scoring the ball at times, you know, with his ball dominance and his defense is weak. So I, I just can't stand watching him play, and I'm just forced. Like, it's very hard when you're such a big fan of the game and you have all these basketball convictions and philosophies that you believe. You just don't believe that a certain guy can be a part of a championship team. You hate yeah. watching him play basketball, and then he gets sent to your team. And, like, I tried last year to believe maybe he has a chance of still winning a ring. But, like, I'm done with try, trying to kid myself into believing just because just because I'm a Clipper fan that they can actually win a ring because they can't. This iteration cannot. And I'm not going to fool myself into believing that they can. Um, and I'm going to be upfront. Like, I don't enjoy watching my team play right now. And this is why being a fan of a team is tough and why I respect long-term fans of teams because – if, if I was a player fan, I could I always like my my team because I like my favorite player that I'm following around. I'm a Clipper fan. I'm always going to be a Clipper fan, but I don't enjoy the current iteration of the team. I don't enjoy that we traded all our picks for Paul George and gave up on SGA because of Kawhi's ridiculous demands before he even walked through the, through the door. I don't like that we traded for James Harden. We already had Westbrook and gave him the idea that he was the, the point guard we never had in this era. So I disagree with a lot of things. And I'm not a fan of our team right now, but... I know that it'll be over one day, and I'm just going to – it'll all be worth it. I'll, I'll, that's all I know. But it's tough, man. This is what being a team fan's all about and pushing through these tough times. And, you know, I'd rather a team that's worse that I actually enjoy like and like watching that I feel like, you know, it's going to play hard. And I don't feel that way with this team. Yeah, you guys are, like, in a similar boat as the Miami Heat. We have no draft capital. We have one tradable pick in 2030, like – we have nothing right now. Like it's just we we attached the trade for Terry Rozier, like a first round pick in the Terry Rozier trade to get off Kyle Lowry's salary. That sucked. Um, we had to attach first round picks, um, getting Bam out of bio or not Bam out of bio, J Jimmy Butler, like Goran Dragic from five years ago. Like those picks, like are this timeline right now. Like we got him in what two thousand. 16 or something but like we traded our picks in like the, the 2020s basically so we haven't had picks and we don't have cap space so that's the tough part i think we'll have some cap space potentially as long as we get off a contract um an expiring contract like a terry rogier or duncan robinson and then we'll have some cap space in 2026 and that's when luca could be available De'Aaron fox could be available like there's all these other players that are probably going to, you know, pick up their player options or get extensions, but Joel Embiid, Steph Curry, like there's a whole bunch of guys that are going to be available. So we're kind of in a similar situation right now um, where we don't have the, you need to develop a team. You need draft capital. Like you need to be like, you need to be a lottery team, which we're not right now, both of us, right? You need to get like a top 10 pick one through 10, and then you need to have cap space eventually once those players develop and trade. Like, look at Boston's formula. Like, really good job, right? It, what, was, what was Brown? The fifth pick, seventh pick, whatever it was? So they had Jason Tatum at three. Jalen was third. He was also third, whatever. So, yeah, we got two guys at three. You know, they develop, and then, you you know, you tinker and you add different players around them. Like, Horford eventually comes in, and then you trade Marcus Smart, get Derek White at Przingis. Like, that's a formula right there. They had the draft capital, then they had the space eventually and through trade. So I don't see the Miami Heat. That, that That's not a vehicle for the Miami Heat right now. It doesn't sound like that's a vehicle for the Clippers right now um, in the future. But do you think the Russ trade um, to the Nuggets um, brings the Nuggets back into the conversation um, as a top contender or not? Because there's so many teams that are ascending in the West. Like, the West is going to be a gauntlet next year, like like even all the way to nine and ten in the play-in, you know, because that could be the Rockets, that could be the Spurs. It's going to be tough to get out of the West. So you don't think you were shaking your head? No, you don't think that moves the needle for for them? No, I think they're still a top four team in the West, but they lost KCP and they already were short on depth. Huge. Russell Westbrook for KCP is not going to get them back to the top, of winning a championship. Yeah, their bench is not deep enough. They have. I mean, they added Dario Saric. Are you kidding me? What about that guy? Not huh? bad. Not bad. Not great. I mean, he could be their stretch five coming off the bench. Um, spelling joker, I guess, right? I mean, who is their backup big? They didn't have De one, really. That was yeah, a big problem. DeAndre wasn't playing, right? He's not Right, and then they deemed DeAndre kind of like not good enough, and they were like without a backup big. Yeah, the West is going to be going to be wild, though. So 
let's go back to PG real quick though, and and the Sixers fit. Do you think that elevates them to become a contender finally? Do you think that the process will finally get to an Eastern Conference Finals next season, or do you think the Knicks and the Celtics are probably going to go to the the Eastern Conference Finals? Because who knows if they're healthy? The Sixer team on paper, man, adding Paul George as maybe their third best player. I don't know if we want to elevate yeah, that he is. over he him. Is. Yeah, he is, right? Okay, good. I'm not crazy for saying that. Um, I mean, that big three, but then the pieces around them, like, again, tying it back to Miami Heat, baby, Kayla Martin. That's that's a that's a good pickup there right there. If he's healthy and his life is going to be a lot easier playing to get around those three versus Jimmy and Bam, they're not elite offensive players, right? And, you know, those guys just play in the paint. Like, Embiid and Maxi could spread the floor 100 times better than Jimmy and Bam can, but then you throw in Kelly Oubre, like a, a dynamic athletic wing, and then their bench, like with the veteran presence, like Kyle Lowry just signed back to another Miami Heat reference, even though we hate him. He signed for a one year deal. He's going to be your backup point guard. He's going to be coming off the bench with Eric Gordon, someone you know in your Clipper system back in the day, right? Like he's old, but he's capable of giving you an, like a good night here and there, scoring 10 points off the bench. Andre Jumman. He played 12 minutes a game last year last year and he almost averaged a double double still. Like he's only 29 years old. So what are your thoughts on the Sixers before we close out? They're gonna be good, uh, especially in the regular season, I think. But as you said, it really comes down to Embiid's health. Every single year it's like he's injured, but he's still playing. There's always an excuse that he's like injured when he doesn't play well. Uh for me, I think they can max out of the East Conference finals. They're not making the finals, in my opinion. Paul George is gonna mess at the highest level, he's gonna he's gonna find a way to blow it. Embiid, I still don't fully trust. Uh, the Knicks and the Celtics are the two best teams in the East for me, but the Sixers are probably third. Yeah, no, I don't, I don't have faith in the Sixers' health because I mean, Paul George, he played seventy-seven games last year. Like, good for you, that was cool. But seventy-seven or seventy-four, seventy-four, okay. seventy, whatever. What, but that's whatever, potato, potato, whatever. For him, that's like a million games. You know, like yeah, the year, like that's like the first time it feels like in the last five years he's played more than fifty-four games or something. So. For for that, that's great. That could be like a new trend. Like that would be key. But it's like not only Embiid is traditionally hurt. Like it's Paul George has missed many playoffs. Again, he's had a really good run, but he, you know, unfortunately had to go up against LeBron and D Wade and Chris Bosh. Like when he was young in at Indiana. Like outside of that, like with the Thunder and with the Clippers, he hasn't really had a signature playoff. Like maybe when he took you guys to the. Um, the Western Conference Finals, right? What year was that? O two. Paul George. Wait, did you guys get to the Western Conference Finals with him? Paul George. Yeah. Two thousand twenty-one. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll say that like that was his signature, I guess, performance outside of that one year against the the Heat when he was on the Pacers, right? When he went toe to toe with LeBron. So can't really count on him. And I mean, yeah, some of the role players are old, so like injury could be an issue, and just the ability to compete and perform, like a Kyle Lowry. And Andre Drummond, even though he's he's thirty years old, but still he's he's not he's not going to make a big difference. And Eric Gordon's thirty five, so that depth might not be that impactful, even if those other guys are healthy too. Because it does take a player like an Eric Gordon to win you a game in a round in the playoffs, or a Kyle Lowry. Like they're still capable. So, but I still think the Knicks are better, even though they're like a team full of mid players, except for Jalen Brunson, who's obviously ascending. I just don't can't I just can't come to give. The Knicks any credit because I hate them more than any team, um, more than Boston and the Sixers. So I don't know. Before we close, I know I said 20 minutes, but what are your thoughts on adding Mikel Bridges and um, who else did they add? They Or they, I guess they re-signed OG. What are your thoughts on the Knicks? Any chance to beat the Celtics come out of the East next year? Yeah, they have a chance. I don't see them winning a, t- a title, though. I still think having a number one option that's 6-3 and under or under 6-3 is like not – it's not I, – I agree with Becky Hammond. Like, if you look at NBA history, she's right. Guys that are under 6'2 or 6'3 that are not named Steph or Isaiah Thomas don't win. Ring is the best player, consensus best player. So I think they might he might have a trouble there. But I'll tell you what, having Bridges, having OG, having Josh Hart, perfect personnel to throw at the Boston Wings. So they put this team together in mind, try to beat the Celtics. And I think that they've got a really good shot. Obviously, losing Isaiah Hartenstein is a big loss. He was awesome in the playoffs. But Mitchell Robinson, like that's the thing now. Mitchell Robinson's got to stay healthy. But their first seven, eight rotation, seven, eight, seven man rotation off the bat, like 
is very good. Like one of the best in the league. Defensively, Hart DiVincenzo is like kind of gritty. Uh, I mean, obviously Bridges is a really good two way player. He's a good defender. Hart, and then I mean, you still got Julius Randle. I don't know about him with his health, and he also falls into that kind of James Harden Russ kind of category where he just doesn't perform well and he's inconsistent when hey, it comes to the I'll, playoffs. I'll say- Okay, but we'll say this. At least James Harden and Russ have still had great series before, great playoff games. Julius Randle's legitimately never had one good playoff series before. At least Westbrook and Harden are a different category. They're still Hall of Famers, you know what I mean? Yeah, he's had like two two good games in the in the six-game series, and then like he'll have four bad games. Harden, as much as I hate Harden and want to discredit him, like if he's in a seven-game series, he might have like – one or two bad games. Those are very important games where he chokes, but like, yeah. it's not like, it's not like Randall where he'll be bad three, four games where he's like putting up 10 points below his like season average, like consistently when you're supposed to be the second guy, like obviously. And that's the thing. Like, I don't think they have enough star power per se to win, but there's so many different variables. Like we don't know, like, cohesion of the chemistry of these Villanova boys playing together it could be just like the perfect recipe and like Jalen might be good enough like he might be that like Allen Iverson mini bulldog type dude that can carry this team if Randall can play okay enough and he has these other dudes around him that can be three and D like wing players that can just be two-way menaces like anything can happen Boston can have Tatum can get hurt you know like Jimmy can get hurt again like I mean, every championship is defined by some sort of injury. Like, look at the Boston Celtics. Of course, they're the best team in the NBA, and I still think they probably would have won a championship. But look at their Mickey Mouse run. Every damn series. No Jimmy Butler, no Terry Rozier. Like, come on. And then Donovan Mitchell misses two games, and Jared Allen missed a game in that series. And then you have Halliburton missing games, and it's like, come on. Like, I'm not taking, I'm not discrediting them that, but I'm saying, like, that can happen for the Knicks next season, right? Like, they have an easy path. Boston gets hurt in the finals and then something happens weirdly in the West or just it's like Denver too. Like they were, they were, they couldn't get past Steph Curry and the Warriors. And then they finally, they add Aaron Gordon, right. Who realized he can't be that number one guy in Orlando. He comes in and he's that, he's like that number three, number four. They add KCP. They draft Michael Porter. Murray ascends. Joker becomes the best player basically in basketball. And, you know, they find the right puzzle pieces to win, you know, and maybe that can happen with the Knicks, but fuck that because the Knicks suck. They haven't won in 50 years. Neither have the Sixers, basically. So at least I have that to enjoy because the Heat are not going to be good necessarily for a while. Maybe the same with your Clippers, but who knows? 2026 might be the year for both of us, right? We need to reset. We need to add some youthful players to our team. And yeah, it's interesting to see how our teams are going to do. But anyway, went way over time. Went way over time for this first episode, but I haven't seen my cousin in months. I haven't talked to him in a long time. And it was kind of nice talking about just the NBA outside. Even though we started off, obviously, talking about the Miami Heat and Jimmy Butler, but it was refreshing to be able to talk about um, other teams for once because there's not a lot going on, Heat Nation. As you know, like we're almost a second apron team. We only have $1 million until we get to the second apron. And we're not going to be a second apron team because we know the penalties for being a second apron team. So the Miami Heat are running it back and we'll see what happens. If a trade happens, that's cool. If not, it's going to be fun watching the team no matter what. So anyway, thank you so much, Dar, for jumping on. Again, do you want to let the audience know where they can find you before we hop off? Yeah, sure. I mean, you can find me on my own show where I talk all things NBA, NBA history, and LA sports with a focus on LA basketball on my own channel, Dime Dropper. And then if you want to listen to my weekly show, Locked On Clippers, the Locked On Podcast Network, that's Locked On Clippers, wherever you get your podcasts or on YouTube. And yeah, follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Dime Dropper Pod, where I talk all basketball things, including Miami Heat. All right. Thanks again. Thank you.